A few weeks ago, I delivered a sermon that related a piece of metaphoric advice for spiritual seekers. In the desert, a thirsty man should dig one deep well, not ten shallow ones. We live in a world where spiritual and religious depth is regularly sacrificed for breadth, where superficiality is the rule and profundity the exception. In this age of commoditization, we often shop for a spiritual path the same way that we might shop for a new pair of pants, trying on one pair after the other, pausing just long enough to admire ourselves in the mirror before moving on to something a little more comfortable. We live in a world where casually scooping up, mixing and matching the trendiest spiritual practices du jour to create personal designer cocktail religions has become fairly standard practice. Ours is a world whose landscape is littered with shallow wells that never struck water. And we, we Unitarian Universalists, with our freedom to search for truth and meaning, with our multiple sources of spiritual wisdom, we UUs are especially vulnerable to falling into this kind of superficial religious experience if we are not careful. A few weeks ago, I asked this congregation to ponder three questions. One, what is it specifically that makes us a single well instead of several? Two, if we you use are a single well, how do we dig our well deep? And three, what exactly is the water that we are all trying to reach? My thanks to all who took these questions seriously. Some of you emailed me your responses. Some of you posted your answers on our Facebook group page. And before I try my own hand at wrestling with these questions, I'd like to briefly share some of the responses that y'all came up with. First, what makes us a single well instead of several? Well, many answered that we are a single well because of our unique history and our legacy of radical love, freedom, and constant evolution. Second, how do we dig deep? One answer said, by intentionally living our values, with a recognition and warning that this is far more challenging than it sounds and will require both reflection and action. Several spoke of embracing our specific history and traditions, including exposing ourselves to more direct source material from Unitarian, Universalist, and Unitarian Universalist writers and thinkers. For the third question, what exactly is the water that we are trying to reach? We received several interesting answers connection to source, achieved by going within for our unique experience of the divine. Another one, it depends. For some, it is an experience of the transcendent, a connection with that which is beyond all of us, yet connects us all. For some, it is simply the peace of knowing that this one short life well lived is enough. Another answer, communion i.e. a community of intense sharing and intimacy. And one UUCJer who said that she grew up as a Christian answered like this, I've often wondered whether having a conception of the divine is necessary in order to engage with it. But since I find any conception to be lacking, I am at a spiritual impasse. It's quite frustrating because at UUCJ, I feel so intellectually and ethically engaged, but spiritually, I feel a bit empty, and I'm not sure where to go from here. There is some powerful insight in all of these answers. These and other answers inspired and influenced my own reflection on these questions, which I will now add to this hopefully ongoing conversation. Turning back to our first question, what specifically makes UUism a single well? And to answer this, I'm going to start with the opinion of Connie Goodbread. Connie is currently on the Congregational Life Staff of the UUA Southern Region, and she has decades of experience as a UU religious educator. Connie has written that Unitarian Universalism is distinct from other religions, that is, UUism is a unique well of faith because of a combination of three characteristics. First, we are a faith based in covenant, not creed. 
we encourage our members to come to their own conclusions regarding ultimate questions. As a non-creedal faith, freedom is our highest value, freedom of thought, freedom of belief, freedom to search for truth. But, and this is a big but, there is a massive difference between theological freedom and theological anarchy. Our individual freedoms are freely bound by our own choice to gather together into covenanted communities. In other words, through our covenants, our mutual shared promises rooted in our core values, we voluntarily choose to delimit, to restrict our freedom of action and belief for the greater good of our community. Now, this covenantal, non-creedal aspect of our faith leads naturally to Connie's second distinctive feature of UUism, its commitment to pluralism. We are a faith that celebrates diversity. Having no creed means that we are actively inviting a membership with vastly differing views on the nature of God, the meaning of life, the meaning of death, and what it means to be human. Considering that we so highly value theological diversity within our churches, it stands to reason then that we should also value that diversity outside our church as well. That is to say, UUism should be the best religion out there when it comes to building interfaith bridges and doing interfaith work. We UUs should be the first ones to stand up and embrace and celebrate the myriad of beautiful faith traditions and practices of our religious neighbors and co-laborers. I guess a question I have to ask, though, is, are we there yet? According to Connie, the third distinctive feature of UUism is our belief that revelation is not sealed. In other words, our understanding of capital T truth, is always open to revision. It means, in the language of some of us, that God is still talking. And so, we have a responsibility, a sacred duty, to keep listening. Knowing that all our truth claims are open to revision, it stands to reason that we should hold on to our current views of truth with an open hand and not a closed fist. In other words, we should speak our truth with utmost humility. Such humility should be a cardinal virtue of UUism. Sadly, I don't think it is yet. But such humility is absolutely necessary if we are to continue to evolve, to change with the times, to continue to become what this world needs and thereby remain relevant and useful because we know that there is a blessing in being useful. And now I'm going to add a fourth element to Connie's three, in addition to being covenantal non-creedal, celebrating diversity, and being open to new revelation. I believe we are a distinct and unique, unique faith because of our free church tradition. We are a radically democratic faith. UU congregations have the freedom to elect their own leaders, including their own ministers. This implies that as a faith, we believe every person has the potential to hear the voice of truth without need of an intermediary, such as a priest or a bishop. Our ecclesiastical hierarchy is inverted. That means that we believe in the power and the potential of people. That hope, that belief, in the power and potentiality of humanity that is core to our faith. So if you put all that together, that's a pretty big part of our well. And from this, I think that there are a couple of safe conclusions that we can make about our faith. First of all, Unitarian Universalism is messy. No creed plus diversity of thought and belief plus never settled truth plus Hope in people equals chaos. If we truly successfully live our theology, UUism will always be more chaotic than other religions. It is unavoidable. On a structural level, we are built for conflict, chaos, and inefficiency. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't have some semblance of order occasionally, but even at our best, we are going to be way messier than others.
So for all of you Jays on the Myers-Briggs, for all of you Virgos out there, take a deep breath and relax. A second conclusion. Unlike just about every other faith tradition out there, our faith is built on a foundation of uncertainty. Most other religions try to provide absolutely certain answers to the ultimate questions. We, on the other hand, tend to do the opposite. Instead of providing answers, we just provide more and hopefully better questions. So if that is what our spiritual well looks like, how do we dig deep? Well, surprise, surprise, I'm going to answer that question with another question. It goes like this. Do all of the elements that make us a unique well of faith, those four elements I just detailed, do they, by their very nature, make it impossible or at least very difficult for us to dig deeply? It seems to me that the process of metaphorical digging involves necessarily meeting and overcoming resistance. That struggle, that straining to push a shovel through a wall of dirt. But with our unique theological freedom and openness, with our embrace of diversity and pluralism, with our loose hold on truth, with our rejection of a centralized authority, you have to admit we are an incredibly squishy religion. Our membrane is super permeable. How can one struggle within a faith that seemingly has no internal theological resistance because we have so few, if any, absolutes? I'm going to switch metaphors for just a second. Forget about wells and dirt. For right now, think about this. When I was a child, one of my elementary teachers told me this story. When she herself was a child, one day she stumbled upon a cocoon, and she saw movement in that cocoon. The moth inside was about to break free. She watched the painful struggle of the moth straining to free itself from that cocoon, and out of a sense of mercy uh, or impatience, my teacher reached out and opened the cocoon with her fingers. The moth easily crawled out of the cocoon but something was terribly wrong. Its crumpled wings laid dormant, glued to its body. You see, the struggle of a moth attempting to break free from its cocoon, it's a necessary part of the evolutionary design. The moth needs to struggle against the cocoon in order to pump blood into its crumpled wings so that they will become strong and unfurl. Without the struggle against his cocoon, this moth's wings never opened, and within a few seconds, he died on the spot. The struggle, pushing against the resistance of our cocoon, is what allows us to spread our wings, to complete our metamorphosis, to evolve. Now, religiously speaking, for that struggle and breakthrough to occur, we may li likewise need some form of internal resistance, something to push against. But in such a radically open, radically tolerant religion, where do we find that theological resistance? Where do we find that thing to beat our wings against? Other faiths offer internal resistance in the form of creeds, commandments, inerrant prophecies, and from my perspective, most importantly, stories from authoritative texts. The internal resistance created by these structures allow a religion to transform not only its adherence, but the religion itself. The struggle manifests itself in reinterpretation, adaptation, and subversion of the old stories that make the faith new again. The common evolutionary path we see for many religions is that of an ascending spiral, breaking from old ways to new ways, back to the old ways, though at a different altitude, then back to the old new ways. The lifeblood of a religious tradition is its own internal struggle to birth, kill, and then transformatively resurrect the same core stories. 
And for years, Unitarianism and Universalism did precisely that. But then 1961 happened. So a question I have is, did the 1961 merger of Unitarianism and Universalism lead us to a final transformative stage of religious evolution that loosened all relevant theological restrictions and thus created an unsustainably progressive faith? Instead of digging deep into our core stories, instead of wrestling with our ideas as Jacob wrestled with God at Penuel in the book of Genesis, instead of struggling to crucify and resurrect our long-held interpretations of ultimate matters, we now have the freedom to simply discard uncomfortable vestiges of our religious heritage and casually replace them by scooping up a more comfortable idea from the roots of an entirely different faith tradition and claiming it for our own. So how do we dig deep in that kind of faith? How will our faith make its next evolutionary leap? It's a question that I leave open for you to consider. Now finally, our third question of the day, what exactly is the water that we are all digging for? Whatever this metaphoric water is, it must be understood broadly enough so that it can simultaneously quench the thirst of UU humanists, UU theists, and UU spiritualists. Otherwise, we're all digging separate wells. So, because we are a community with atheists and agnostics, this has to be something bigger than God. This water has to be the God behind the God. In short, and at the risk of a little bit of reductionism here, this morning I'm arguing that even among UU theists who might believe in a personal God, there has to be something even bigger behind that God. Transcendence and divine union, those are not actually ultimate goals of UU theists. They are pen ultimate goals. They are not an end unto themselves. They are means to an even bigger end. That end is communion with the God behind God. The God behind God is that which makes any God or gods worthy of worship in the first place. For example, for the sake of argument, let's say that I am a UU theist and that I believe in a personal God. Now, what do I believe makes this God worthy of my worship? Pretty good answer here might be love. Maybe that's why God is worthy of my worship. So when I seek a rapturous divine union with my God, I'm actually doing so in order to connect and commune with that divine love, to embrace it, embody it, make it a part of me, declare it to be the greatest good in the universe, that thing which gives my life meaning. Love is one of perhaps many transcendent values that we seek to join ourselves to, to affirm and promote, to incarnate in this world, to hold up as worthy of worship. And so I would argue that such a communion with those transcendent values a communion that transforms each of us, making us become more than we are, sought and found within the embrace of community, that is the water that all you use, theist, spiritualist, or humanist, are trying to find. We know, sadly, not everyone finds it. You may recall that in my sermon a few weeks ago, I shared this statistic. The average lifespan of a Unitarian Universalist, one who has converted to the faith, is only four to five years. I'm interested to know, by a show of hands, how many of you have been a UU for longer than five years? Thank you for your dedication to our faith. Congratulations, you are our grizzled veterans. Now, also by show of hands, how many of you have self-identified as a UU for less than five years? Less than five years. So you know that I've got my eye on you, right? So my question is, what is it that makes us last in the faith on average only four to five years? I've got a couple of answers that I'm going to suggest this morning. One, I think it is a failure of theology 
and two, a failure of community. For the past several decades, the theology espoused in many UU congregations has ranged from complex to incoherent to non-existent. Today's sermon may have demonstrated the somewhat unwieldy nature of our faith and theology, which makes it hard for new UUs to dig in and grow deep roots. But as important as this theological failure is, I actually don't think that is the primary cause of what I'm going to call premature UU death. I think the real culprit is failure of community. Community. We don't understand radical community. Most churches don't, actually. But UU churches especially, I think, have a hard time with this concept. I think in years past, UU churches were often a landing pad for self-identified radical individualists who were not prepared to make personal sacrifices for the greater good of their community. As a result, UU churches tolerated a lot of bad and selfish behavior. If we are to be a thriving faith of the 21st century, we cannot be afraid to stop selfish, self-centered behavior in our congregations. We cannot be afraid to face the conflict that will bring. Jean Vanier, founder of L'Arche International, says that there are three basic stages anyone goes through when joining a community. First, everyone in the community is an angel. That's the honeymoon period. Do you remember when you were in that period when you first joined here? Wasn't it nice? But then, of course, you get to the second stage. Everyone is a devil. The honeymoon is over. Tragically, most people leave the community at this point before they ever make it to that third level of community, at that third level where angels and devils converge, and we realize that actually everyone is just a human being. And with that stage, if we're lucky, comes the humbling realization that within this community, at one point or another, each one of us, we too, have played the role of angel, devil, and human being. I think we sometimes confuse the goal of beloved community with perfect community. The problem is there's no such thing as perfect community because community is made up of imperfect, messy, flawed human beings. And that means conflict is going to happen. A community without conflict is not really a community. The two biggest movies this year in America have been Batman versus Superman, and Captain America Civil War. Now, what is something that these, these two movies, that they both teach us? Sometimes friends fight, and that's okay. You know what it means when you fight? It means that you're actually friends. It means that you have come to a place where you are dropping the artifice and pretense. You're being real with each other. You're allowing yourself to be vulnerable with each other. And when that happens, sometimes people get hurt. If you live with authenticity and vulnerability, I promise you that in this life, you will both hurt and be hurt. You will bloody noses just as your nose will get bloodied. But how we respond to those incidents is what matters most. Will we take responsibility for our words and actions and seek to make things right? Or will we cast blame on others and refuse to accept personal responsibility and keep on hurting people? If we are to incarnate the beloved community here, we cannot fear or run from conflict. But we also cannot run from our responsibility to answer for our words and actions, our responsibility to restore each other, to help heal the hurts that we have created, to learn and grow from the experience. And a community that does that, that is the beloved community. And that is what we must evolve to become. Blessed be.